All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am, of course, your host, Sam Charrington, and today I'm super excited to be joined by Kate Sienko, Associate Professor at Boston University and a consulting professor for the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to digging into our conversation. Uh, you are a very, very busy woman at CVPR. You've got a ton of workshops that you're speaking at, uh, as well as numerous papers. Uh, we will scratch the surface of all that activity in our conversation today. But before we do that, I'd love to have you introduce yourself to our guests and share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in the field. Yeah, definitely. Um, I am a professor of computer science at Boston University, as you mentioned. I lead a research group focused on deep learning, especially applied to visual recognition. And I'm specifically interested in many topics, um, some of which are things like vision and language models, and also data set bias and adaptation to out of distribution data also efficient models and AI forensics. And I would say that more broadly, one of my goals is to create AI that can see and can understand language and uh, interact with humans in a natural way. Um, and also help us solve problems in society like helping people who are visually impaired or helping the environment. Um, so that's briefly about my research. Uh, how I came to the field, um, I got interested in uh, AI pretty early on. I was always a fan of science fiction. So um, when I decided to uh, go to graduate school, um, I, was, um, I started as a graduate student at MIT, actually uh, studying speech recognition. And... Um, Later on, I switched to uh, computer vision, but um, I, I've always been really fascinated about you know, robots and artificial intelligence and, and kind of related areas. So I got my PhD from MIT, and then I did a postdoc for a couple of years, and um, then I became a faculty member. So I've basically been working in the AI field for a long time. And it's been really amazing to see, especially in computer vision, the, the transformation that our field has gone through. Um, because when I started as a graduate student, you know, computer vision, I, I think I can say that it didn't work um, <laughs> for most things. Um, you know, certain things worked. Um, face detection was working pretty well, but... Um, it's nothing like what we're seeing here, and it's just been so exciting to see this revolution. It's, it hasn't really, it hasn't really been boring for me. Um, so I'm, I'm very, kind of, um, I think I'm lucky that um, I get to do this kind of work and this kind of research. Absolutely, uh, you mentioned your interest in kind of vision and language together, uh, and how those. Um, you know, you, sh you shifted from one to the next and, and now they're kind of coming together. And uh, one of the things that you're doing at CVPR is speaking at the Multimodal Learning and Applications Workshop. And I guess the first thing that jumps out at me is, you know, your reference to kind of an exciting time for computer vision. It's also a super exciting time for this idea of multimodal machine learning. We've been kind of you know, doing that for a bit, but the, you know, visual transformers and kind of the convergence of these two architectures over the past uh, little bit has really opened up a big opportunity there. And I'd love to hear you kind of riff on your view of multimodal as a field and the, the opportunity before us and kind of the research frontier. Multimodal learning has been around for a long time. Um, actually, I mentioned that when I was uh, starting as a graduate student, I was actually looking into audiovisual speech recognition, which is essentially lip reading. 
Um, so using both audio and the movement of someone's lips to understand speech. Um, so that's one example of multimodal learning. And then for my PhD, I actually worked on trying to learn about visual categories of different objects using text uh, that we can scrape from the web. Um, and this was before deep learning really took off. Um, but kind of the, the uh, ideas, these ideas have been around for a long time, right? Can we uh, learn something from both audio and video? Can we uh, get free data, essentially free labeled data from the web? Right? So people have been trying this for a while. And I think one of the really breakthroughs that we're seeing now is the um, qualitative scale in the amount of data that we can get from the web and train on, right? Um, there was a very recent paper that I just saw talking about emergent properties of large models. Um, and I, I do agree that when we reach a certain scale, you know, both in terms of training data and size. So of course those are correlated. You typically need a lot more data to train a very large model with lots and lots of parameters. I think that you start seeing properties that are emerging that you're not seeing with smaller models and smaller data sets. So I think that's what we're seeing now with, you know, things like DALI 2 um, and um, kind of very cool uh, results that combine vision and language. And so one, one thing that I'm talking about at the workshop is how we can use this uh, training data that is essentially free, right? So uh, probably you've heard of CLIP, uh, which is an open AI model that really, I would say, transformed our field over the last little while because they were able to collect lots of training data by scraping photos and their captions from the web. So if we have access to this kind of data and we can learn not just from images with tags that have to be sort of manually labeled like ImageNet data, but we have an image and we have a, a category label for each image, right? So, I mean, this data is, is good and we have been training on this data for all kinds of computer vision applications. You know, usually you pre-train on this data and then you fine tune on your own data set. It turns out that if you can pre-train on the captioned images from the web, you actually can do much better, especially on um, zero shot learning, where you have a new category that you haven't seen, you don't, you don't have any training data for this category. It turns out that you know these models, these vision language pre-trained models actually generalize better than just traditional image classification data sets um, for pre-training. So you were talking about the opportunities presented by all of the information that's out on the internet that is, you know, visual information with associated text. You know, one of the obvious questions that that begs, or you know, I guess it's obvious in light of the, the recent history of large language models, uh, is the inherent bias in the in internet information. And I recently saw a tweet that was, I think someone ha with access to Dolly 2 or something like Dolly 2 typed in, you know, engineers, and it was kind of these generated images of all male engineers standing around or, you know, doctors, same kind of thing. Now, curious your thoughts on, on that. And, you know, really, it's a question of like having access to, you know, that kind of volume of information is... Um, you know, clearly beneficial in some ways, but it also has, you know, we also need to be conscious of those biases. How are you thinking about that? Yeah, I I think that the the bias in data sets is in some sense inevitable. Um, and this is something that I've been working on also for a long time, kind of how do we deal with the fact that our data sets are biased simply because they're finite, right? It's very hard to sample the entire visual world um, and avoid bias. And especially since, as I mentioned, we have been really trying to go to the internet for our data source in the last, you know, say, decade or so, or a couple of decades. Um, 
because it's free, it's easy. It's <laughs> um, there. Yeah, it's there. I mean, it's a lot harder to, you know, we used to actually have graduate students go to the lab and take pictures of objects. And that's that was the training data or take pictures of people. Um, I remember having to collect a data set in the lab and get a signed release form from every person that walked in that we recruited, you know, making sure that they're okay with us using their data. Um, but we're in a different world now. You know, you go to the internet and you have billions of images and videos at your fingertips. And um, I think we're almost, it feels to me like we're in a gold rush kind of era with respect to, you know, how data is really king right now and whoever can get their hands on the most data in some sense is winning the AI race, right? Um, so I feel like these concerns are very much important um, and we should definitely be worrying about them. Um, that's not something that I particularly work on in, in my research, uh, but there's great people out there who work on these kinds of more ethical questions. Um, although, you know, I, I had a paper a while back, um, the first time that I noticed really this kind of bias in image caption data was, um, some of the very first times that we were able to get deep learning to generate captions for images, right? And we were working with a, a fairly small by today's standards data set, um, and, uh, but, you know, at the time it was a large scale data set and, you know, when the, the model started working, it was amazing. You know, literally the year before that, the best captions that you could generate sounded very, um, awkward, very robotic. You know, they would say things like there is one building and grass, you know, <laughs> uh, they were templated. And once we got the image captioning, uh, to work with language models uh, using neural networks, you know, because one of the major uh, advancements, of course, in image captioning is being able to generate fluent, natural sounding language. Um, and once we developed these models that no longer had two separate stages, where in the first stage you detect all the objects, and the second stage you have your template and you plug in the objects you detected in the sentence template, right? So that's how you get the robotic sounding captions. Um, but so now instead of that, we had uh, an end to end model that you just feed it images and captions and it just learns a single neural network that takes the raw image and spits out the entire sentence, the entire caption, right? And, you know, it was amazing to see, I remember this, you know, we had a paper on this and a few other labs had a paper on this. It made the New York Times. It was really amazing, you know, how fluent these captions sounded like. But then we started looking at this more and digging into results more. And, and we did notice the, that these, these models definitely learn shortcuts. They learn to exploit the biases in the data. And so one of the examples uh, that we wrote about in our paper is um, when you have a data set where most of the, uh, for example, images of snowboarders have captions that say, um, you know, a man is snowboarding. Um, then the model sort of learns the shortcut that if you see something that looks like a snowboarder or perhaps even snow, um, you, you should start the sentence by a man is you know, and, and, and then complete it according to maybe what, what else you detect in the image. But um, it's a pretty good shortcut because it will minimize your loss, your training loss, because you'll get it right on most of the training examples. And that's all really that these models care about. So um, we try to address this kind of bias in the paper. Um, but, you know, I think we still don't have a very good solution and we, we definitely need more work um, to improve this kind of, you know, to, to um, improve our models so that they don't have these egregious biases. And it's only getting worse, right? Of course, that now we have giant data sets, uh, hundreds of millions or even a billion images 
much, much harder to both audit them and to ensure that they don't take shortcuts like this. Mm -hmm. And the models are a lot more complex and difficult to intuit about and understand. That's right. They're, they're very black box, right? Yeah. So your talk at the this multimodal learning and applications workshop is more language, less labeling, vision and language pre-training for visual tasks. Um, it immediately calls to mind something that I've been spending a lot of time exploring recently, this whole idea of data-centric AI. Um, and in particular, like you start out talking about the cost of labeling and the burden that that, you know, creates for folks that want to build applications in the space. How has that played out for you? This is something that I've been interested in the last few years. How do we train models, especially for new tasks or new domains, without having to collect uh, and label a lot of data? And I can talk about sort of, up, you know, applications where this comes up, but I think it's a lot of applications, actually. And so this idea of, okay, we're going to get a fixed data set and train on it, and then that's it. That's all we need. That's really not how things work in real life. In real life, you, you want to um, build an application. You have certain things that you want your model to recognize in images. And there are often things that you don't have a lot of training data for. Um, you have to um, pay uh, someone to label it. It costs a lot of money. Um, depending on what the labels look like, you might actually need experts. You might need to you know, find someone who is actually good at labeling and, um, and the scale, and uh, it just doesn't scale very well. So um, I think what one of the really exciting things that people have been doing recently is um, figuring out, first of all, that these very large scale models that are trained on this web scale data, like Clip, for example, um, you can prompt them to get them to learn very quickly. Sometimes there's no, not even any learning involved. You just um, uh, give them some textual input telling them what you want recognized. And then you don't need any additional training data to um, get a very good improvement already on your task. Um, of course, you can improve uh, further if you had tra training data, but if you don't have any training data or ha only have a few labels, these kinds of um, prompting methods seem to be working quite well. Um, so that's one of the things that I was going to mention in the workshop is some, some very recent work where uh, we try to essentially um, prompt a, a model like Clip uh, pre-trained on a large web scale data set of images and captions um, and then prompt it at test time to classify categories in a zero shot way so that where you don't have any labels for those categories um, you just want the model to kind of uh, generalize uh, to any label that you can throw at it essentially um, and it does do much better than previous work on this task can you talk about the the methodology that you uh, pursued in that in that work uh, was a lot of the the challenge figuring out the right way to prompt the model. So we actually have two um, lines of work in this direction. One is exactly this challenge of how to prompt the model correctly. Um, and for example, you know, again, we start with a pre-trained model that already exists, you know, very hard to retrain these models when you're experimenting with them. So oftentimes you just, you know, download one that OpenAI has made available. Um, so we start with uh, a pre-trained model, especially, you know, Clip is the one that we often work with. And um, then we want to um, prompt it with essentially some textual tokens. Um, it's already learned to take text tokens as input and the image as input, compare them, and then predict a score that basically says, yes, these, this, this textual string and this image are highly related, or no, they're not related. 
Um, but the during pre-training, of course, these models are uh, learning to compare captions, right? So a caption is a more general kind of label for an image. It could say, you know, um, there is a group of people playing frisbee in the park. But what we're trying to do is now take that model and just we just want to know is there a frisbee in this image? So we want to classify the label frisbee or we want to classify the label car or person. So um, so, so it presents a, a problem because the model wasn't trained for that specific task and we need to tweak it. We need to do something uh, to get it to do this task. Um, and so um, one of the contributions um, in this work is to figure out a way to prompt a model with um, both a positive and a negative prompt. So you think of the prompt as saying, is there a blank in this image, for example, where the blank is the, the word for the class you're trying to detect, like Frisbee. Um, and what that does is it makes the task a lot more similar to what the models learned about, because it seems to the model that you're giving it a, a caption, essentially. But it's a fake caption, of course. You just created a fake caption and, and just inserted the word for the class that you wanted to recognize. Um, and so what we did is, in addition to this positive prompt, where we say, is there a blank in the image? And we replace the blank with the, with the label. So is there a Frisbee? We also give it a negative prompt, which is saying, essentially, think of it as uh, the negative question, right? Is there no Frisbee in the image? And then we compare the score that the model gives for the positive and the negative. And if the positive score is higher, then we predict that, yes, there is a Frisbee in the image. In a sense, it's, um, it's a bit analogous to the kind of games that you might play with a human labeler where, or with human, in human labeling, where you ask multiple labelers to label an image and compare their responses. This is just kind of a, a clever way to do that, not to minimize it, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and then we had to do some other tricks to extract the spatial information in a more fine grain matter. Um, Elaborate I don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's um, it's actually not um, nothing nothing fancy. Um, but what the image and caption model does is it takes the whole caption and compares it to the whole image. And it makes sense, right? Because when you're training the model, you don't know which part of the caption corresponds to which part of the image, right? So a group of people playing Frisbee in the park, you don't know where the Frisbee is located in the image, right? Uh, but for our task, we are only looking for the Frisbee, not the entire scene. So we actually uh, wanted wanted to focus in a more fine-grained way on the region where the object might be. So what we do is we um, do some surgery on this network to, to instead compare our prompt at each location in the image. Okay. And then um, decide if the object is there instead of first kind of aggregating over the whole image and then comparing. So and that turns out that works a little bit better. Kind of akin to... A convolutional window you're just taking slices and passing them into the model yeah actually the model already has um features that are that it's computing at each sub window in the image okay. it's just that then that later on it is uh, pooling them and aggregating them into a single vector and we just kind of mm -hmm. go in and do some surgery and, and okay compare before it does. So actually we don't learn, I think the cool thing about this work is that we don't learn any new parameters except for these prompt tokens. Mm -hmm. um, so all the surgery we do, we don't introduce any learnable parameters, which means uh, there's very little overhead in learning. So we, we need very little data to actually tune the model to do this task. Um, I think in our paper, we report something like, um, you know, something like maybe 20,000 parameters, the extra that we're learning. 
Okay. And it's it's just these token embeddings um, that are fed in as the prompt. And the these token embeddings, is there a a fixed set of labels that you like? You're starting with a fixed set of labels, then you create these prompts, and you know that's where the token embeddings come from. Yeah. So the tokens are the prompt. Um, so you can think of them as some words, but actually we're just learning some arbitrary words and each word is embedded into a continuous vector. So that's what I mean by token embeddings. Um, so you can think of them as some words like, is there a something in the image? We're not actually specifying what words the model should use. We're just letting it. it learn some words. Uh, okay. Got, <laughs> so, it. Got it. Yeah. I, I think I wasn't following that part. I mm -hmm. thought I heard you describing something more like you identified some you know, relatively standard patterns or something like that, like a template for these mm. prompts, but rather these prompts are learned and they're, they're learned for each of the classes that you're trying to be able to predict. Like it's, you know, if it's tree, a tree, the prompt is specific to tree. Like it's the prompt that produces the best result for tree, as opposed to what might work for car. Is that, am I thinking about that correctly? Uh, yes, you are correct. Although we also did it the other way where the prompt is generic and you just okay. plug in the word that you want to recognize. Okay. So this is really zero shot learning um, because you're not even tuning the prompts for any specific class. You, you, you're tuning the prompts on one set of classes and then the user gives you some new class. You just plug it into the prompts that you've learned. Turns out that also works, um, and our approach also improved performance on this kind of zero-shot recognition, even though the prompts are learned in a generic way and not specific to these um, categories. Mm -hmm. The evaluation, on the topic of evaluation, are you, what are you comparing against? Uh, we are comparing <laughs> against... Um, existing models that try to do this kind of label classification and images, um, some of which are probably um, not working as well because they're not utilizing these very large vision language models that we're utilizing, like CLIP. Um, and this is something that, you know, often comes up now. Is it fair to compare a model that isn't using something that was pre-trained on 400 million images with captions? Um, and, you know, I, I really go back and forth. I think in some sense, yes, it's not fair. Um, and in fact, we don't even know these huge data sets. We don't know what's in them. OpenAI hasn't released the data set that they trained on. It could, in fact, include some of our test data because it's straight from the web. Um, so it doesn't seem like the best experimental protocol to be using. But on the other hand, they work so well. You know, it just you can't deny that you get much better performance and people are using them. So the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. <laughs> on the other hand, models do tend to work well if they've seen the training data. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And we don't know if the model has seen the training data or not. Right. I mean, we also do compare a model to kind of an original clip that hasn't been tuned in the way that I described. And we do perform better than that. Um, so there mm -hmm. is an advantage to what we're doing uh, when we compare mm -hmm. the more mm -hmm. apples to apples way. But I think what's happening now is um, I think that researchers really are going to have to keep up with the latest and greatest pre-trained backbones. And, um, you know, you just, the, 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 the method you develop um, can improve performance on your data set with respect to a backbone like ResNet, for example. But someone could come along with a backbone like Visual Transformer and outperform your whole algorithm just because they have a much better backbone. Right, so it's um, it's like I said, you know, the gold rush or the space race or whatever you want to call it. You know, the bigger, <laughs> the bigger, the better. 
And um, yeah, it's a little bit hard, I think, for researchers to keep up with this. So yeah, I was just going to ask, how does that how does that land for you as a researcher? Like, there's been a lot of talk around, um, you know, just the amount of resources that are going into these, you know, quote unquote, foundation, foundational models, you know, changes what avenues are available to what researchers just based on the resources of their organizations and uh, changes the research directions that, that, that are accessible to them. What, what's your take on that? Yes, I think that's um, a very real issue for many people, especially in academic research labs, but also in many industrial research labs. There are really only a few labs or companies um, that can afford to uh, even train these very large scale models anymore, right? Um, and it's great when they make them publicly available uh, because then the rest of us can kind of experiment with them. We can use them as the feature backbone in our new new algorithms that we're developing. I think that there are some things that probably are really um, capabilities that, as I mentioned earlier, could be emerging only when you have a very large training data set or a very large model that you're training. And so that means that certain kinds of research is now in the realm of only those you know, lucky few that, that have access to both the data and the compute. So the other paper is called Prefix Conditioning Unifies Language and Label Supervision. And um, it's a collaboration with Google. Um, and so here we're also looking at prefix uh, conditioning or prompting rather, but we have a slightly different goal where, as I mentioned, the large vision language models are pre-trained on images with captions, right? Um, and that, that gives us a lot of data that we get for free essentially from the web. But we also do have some label data sets, the traditional data sets like ImageNet, which have an image with uh, a category label. And these two kinds of data are complementary, right? The captioned images um, have a long tail distribution over objects, so they may not cover all the categories that you want to cover, or they may cover them unequally. Or like we mentioned before, they might have some bias, like all the snowboarders are male in the caption, at least. Um, and so we might want to combine that data with just traditional labeled image data that is human annotated and kind of clean or less bias free. And I'm not saying ImageNet is completely unbiased either. Um, so if we wanted to do that for pre-training, it turns out that's what we look at in this paper. It turns out that you can um, do better than just combining the two kinds of data. You can, so there's work uh, from Microsoft that actually try to uh, transform the, the labels in ImageNet into fake captions, right? So if you have an image in ImageNet uh, labeled with Persian cat, you can make a caption out of it by just plugging it into some template, like a close-up of a Persian, Persian cat. So, um, so they did this, and then when you train on both the fake captions and the real captions, you um, do get a, a stronger model, you get a more powerful model um, that combines the knowledge from these two kinds of data. It's kind of like a data augmentation type of approach. Yes, exactly. Um, and it generalizes even better to zero-shot tasks. So new data sets with novel categories, um, it generalizes even better to that. So, uh, so one issue, though, is that now you have two kinds of input data sets, one with real captions and one with fake captions. And these you know, deep models, they're... They're powerful, which means they take shortcuts, as we've been saying. And so what, um, what we found is happening is the model actually knows 
more or less, that it's learning from these are fake captions and these are real captions. And it sort of tries to learn from both kinds of captions. Um, but then it ends up, you know, not really knowing at test time when you give it a new image um, what to do. Because it basically, one way to think of it is it's a little confusing for the model to have, you know, real captions and fake captions. And so what we ended up doing is just something super simple, which is uh, add a token at training time to the real captions that just the token is just saying, this is a real caption. And the fake captions, we add a token that says, this is a fake caption. And when you do that, the model actually learns much better. Uh, it generalizes better. Um, it um, essentially um, helps the model overcome this, these two kinds of domains by telling it, look, these are two kinds of domains so you can process them a little bit differently, right? So there, there's some specialized processing in the language model that we see emerge from that, where if you give it the, the caption and then you prefix it with the real caption token, it will do one thing. But if you prefix that same caption with the fake caption token, it will do another thing. And so for example, you know, if you prefix with the fake caption token, the model will mostly focus on kind of the noun because it's learned that these fake captions, they're just fake. So the only information there is the noun, right? Um, so, and everything else is just kind of a template to it's fool fluff, it yeah. into, yeah, it's fluff, exactly. Um, but if you prefix it with the caption, real caption token, then it will start looking at the whole caption because it knows that in real captions, there is useful semantic information in multiple words uh, across the whole caption. So, so it's kind of does cool. Does an example it. come to mind of, you know, that illustrates kind of the richness of a real, of a real t caption relative to one of these fake captions? Yeah. So, um, this is an example from the paper. It's not a particularly rich caption. Um, but if you have a caption that says a sculpture of an airplane and you prefix it with the, you know, this is a fake caption, then the model ignores the word sculpture and just focuses on the word airplane, right? And then if you prefix it with the real caption token, then the model will actually look at the sculpture as well as the airplane. In some sense, this seems counterintuitive in the sense that, you know, I guess the, the usual thought is, hey, more data, different types of data that will kind of force the model to generalize and that's gonna to lead to better performance. And you're kind of saying that you know, more data, different types of data, the model's not generalizing, it's just learning the, the, the classes and cheating. Right, I think it is a little counterintuitive, um, but I think we've seen this in other work too, that um, when you're training with different kinds of data, heterogen heterogeneous data, sometimes it's better to specialize the model, you know, make it aware that it's being trained with heterogeneous data. Um, and because, you know, I think if you throw everything together, you're giving it also less guidance, right? Adding this prefix token is sort of just giving the model more information. Look, you know, these two uh, sets of images are coming from two different kinds of domains. And then the model can use that or not use that. And it, you know, in this case, it seems to use it to, to its advantage. Kind of on the topic of domain generalization, but maybe switching modalities a little bit. One of the other papers that you're speaking about at CVPR is focused on uh, domain generalization uh, in an unsupervised manner. And this idea of kind of bridging across domains uh, and visual domains in particular. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that paper and the motivation there? Yeah, definitely. So this paper, uh, it's called Unsupervised Domain Generalization by Learning a Bridge Across Domains. And um, we are looking at this problem of 
generalization to new kinds of visual domains. So an example is, um, let's say your model was trained on um, driving data from, collected from a car in California. Um, and then at test time, you're giving it data from, let's say, Boston or New York in the winter. People look different because they're wearing heavy coats and hats, or maybe it's raining, or maybe the trees are, look different, right? So the visual domain has changed, even though the categories you're looking for are the same. It's still people and cars. And another example of this is when um, you train the model on real photos, but then you get a clip art or a painting or some other type of drawing, perhaps. So this is a, a more extreme even domain shift in, in your input data. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of interest in robustness where we want models to be robust to, to kind of changes in the image. So if you change the top left pixel, you know, the, your model shouldn't all of a sudden flip its answer, right? Um, and and there's a lot of work on adversarial robustness where if an adversary changes the top left pixel in a certain way to make the model flip the answer, we don't want that either. But I also think that um, a very, very practical model is not some adversary even or even degradation um, in the image quality, but just, just kind of a different viewing angle or slightly different lighting or um, you know, a little bit uh, of a difference in how that object looks like, like a person with a hat on as opposed to no hat or a winter hat as opposed to summer hats, right? So all of these kinds of variations, we want models to generalize to them, right? We don't want them to break and they do break. They, they, they currently, you know, models do not generalize well to out of domain data, data that is distributed differently from the training set. So, so in this paper, we are trying to fix that by um, doing unsupervised learning where we have a bunch of images. So one example, again, I'll go back to paintings, real images, and clip art and sketches, right? So these are images of the same classes, but from different domains. And what we want the model to do is we want it to learn that, for example, a giraffe is the same as a painting as it is as in a sketch or in a real photo, right? But if you train the model with self-supervised losses, you know, this kind of contrastive learning losses or um, SimClear, MoCo, all of these uh, popular um, unsupervised training objectives, what the model does is it tries to learn how images are similar and it ends up actually learning the domain similarity before category similarity in this case. So we'll learn that a sketch of a giraffe is closer to a sketch of a guitar than it is to a photo of a giraffe, right? Because it's picking up on those more superficial features. Are, are you making the general statement that unsupervised approaches have fared worse in multi-domain uh, or, you know, non-constraint, non-single domain uh, scenarios than, um, than supervised approaches because of this general tendency to favor domain similarity versus uh, object similarity? Yes, I, I, think, I think I will risk making that claim. Okay. Um, <laughs> You know, we, uh, we have a couple papers that supported within certain parameters, but yes, I think what happens when you have multi-domain data with class labels, you know, the class labels are telling the model that this is a giraffe, even though it's a sketch, and this is a giraffe, even though it's a photo. And so- and focus on the giraffeness of the thing as opposed to other, you know, other types of correlations. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so just that supervision of you care about the category, not the domain, that helps you learn a more uh, generalizable representation. But uh, when you have unlabeled data, 
the only training single, uh, signal you're giving to your model is, okay, if you take this sketch of a giraffe and you augment it with some, you know, you add some noise or crop it or rotate it or whatever people do, um, or even just find its nearest neighbor, it should be closer to that nearest neighbor than to some other image in your data that's farther away. And, and there's no category information there. So the model doesn't know that it, that the giraffe should be close to you know, the painting giraffe should be close to the sketch giraffe because in pixel space, there's a huge difference between those two images. Yeah. So just very briefly, um, to describe the main idea in the paper, um, we um, essentially learn this bridge domain. So think of it as creating a version of each training image that tries to remove all the domain specific information and only keep the general kind of outline and the general features of the object, right? So for the giraffe example, uh, it ends up looking kind of like an edge image, but- That was my impression, yeah. Yeah, but unlike an actual, you know, canny edge detector image or traditional edge detector, um, which also picks up on a lot of edges on the background, seeing, you know, a lot of irrelevant edges, um, or it may, uh, on the other hand, remove edges that are important, like the spots on the giraffe, um, because, you know, that's just edge detection. It doesn't know what's important and what isn't. In our approach, this uh, bridge domain is edge-like, but it keeps the semantically important features uh, and edges, like the outline of the giraffe and the spots in the giraffe, but removes all the irrelevant edges. And the edge domain is is learned as well, kind of end to end, uh, as part of as part of training the whole model. Yes. So, and the important thing is that we don't just we don't actually use that edge domain to do the final classification. It's actually um, used to compute which images are similar to each other. Um, and so I think one criticism of this approach initially might be, wait a minute, but if you're using an edge-like domain, aren't you throwing away color information? Well, in fact, we're not. The model is still learning color features, but to learn which objects are similar and which ones are not, we're using this bridge domain, which is edge-like. So does that mean like in the final, in the loss function, there's, you know, some factor relating to the, you know, distance and, you know, the edge domain space and also another factor relating to distance in the, the actual image space? Yes. And in fact, the distance in the edge domain space guides the the model in learning it, it tells it which which are the similar pairs and which are the dissimilar pairs so that it can um, train in the unsupervised way from the original images right so think of it as kind of this uh, we're faking some supervision that is a little bit stronger hopefully than just um, the model by itself trying to figure out which images are similar and which ones are not and being con confused by all of these extraneous kind of textures and domain specific features. And so in creating this edge domain space, um, like how, uh, how handcrafted is that in a sense? Like I'm imagining if you, you know, found a way to create some embedding of the, you know, similar classes uh, that it's not particularly likely that you're going to come out with these cool looking edge images like that. That was more, more handcrafted is what I guess the feel that I'm having here. So I think that, um, it seems maybe handcrafted because we initialize the generator with an edge uh, edge image. Um, so the part of the model that learns to map the original images to the bridge domain is initialized by computing edges of those images. And so 
originally it learns just edge maps, but then as we keep training it in this unsupervised way to kind of learn about objects, essentially, um, it starts to get away from the original just edge detection kind of images and, and starts to, for example, uh, remove some of the irrelevant background edges and keep the relevant ones that are useful for computing kind of object similarity. Well, we'll be linking to your uh, workshop presentations and, and slides, and uh, folks can kind of dig into those for the papers that you've worked on and that you've uh, recognized, cited. Um, but I want to thank you for a, a great discussion. Um, and once again, it sounds like you're going to be super busy at CVPR. <laughs> yeah, but it'll be fun. The first in-person conference in three years. So I'm excited. Well, Kate, thanks so much for taking the time to share with us a bit about what you've been up to. Thank you for having me.